uh, laser and um, continue. And my name is Pamela Winfrey. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to have an amazing panel tonight to talk about uh, resilience from cells to the human experience. Uh, I wanna let you know that it's being recorded. It's gonna be available on YouTube if you wanna see it later and if, or if you have friends that want to, um, who wanna see it and didn't get a chance. And I also wanna encourage you to use the chat on the side, tell us who you are and you can have a, feel free to have a little conversation on the side like, oh, hey, I know you're there and that kind of thing because that's kind of fun. That way you have a little bit more uh, agency in these kinds of um, events and we're trying to build community. So that's a really good thing. So anyway, um, it feels like we are all dealing with this concept of resilience. Uh, certainly the world that we're in, the world of violence and the world of disease is, um, is challenging for us all. And so I was trying to think if there was uh, a way that we could kind of think in new ways and maybe get hints about things that we can do or new ways to think about our condition um, by looking at biology. Um, so we have this stellar group of people here I'm very happy to uh, introduce. Um, there's a very innovative and creative director of the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center, Carlo Maley, um, Jenny Lamb, who is a curator out of Chicago. And my favorite quote about her was she's a polymath wave maker, which of course makes me wanna be one too. And then Chris Johnson, who's an extraordinary transcendent media artist who I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. Um, so we're just gonna go, we'll do, we'll, we'll do um, 10 minutes each and then we'll open it up for um, a conversation with, um, with, every, with all of you. So let's, um, did I get everything I wanted to say? Yes. So Carla, why don't you go ahead and start and, um, and I'll be keeping time and I'll let you know when you have a two minute warning. Okay, very good. Can you all see my screen? Great. All right. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about cancer and, and the thing that I'm most excited about in this field of cancer research and how to deal with cancer. And the first thing I wanted to show you that is that cancer is ubiquitous. It's uh, all living things that have multiple cells in their body, all multicellular organisms have some chance of getting cancer. And this is a ca crested cactus from our crested cactus garden at ASU. And this cresting at the top uh, here is actually what we think is a kind of plant cancer. And it's not lethal. And in fact, it can be quite beautiful. Um, so there's many organisms that are actually resilient to the, um, the phenomenon of cancer and don't die from it. Um, but what I also want to tell you now is what's going on down underneath the hood inside a tumor. And, and cancers are actually mosaics of billions of cells with millions of mutations. And I sort of like to represent it this way with lots of different colors, representing all the different mutant cells in a tumor. And this makes cancers very resilient. Um, it's because they evolve. So when we apply a therapy to a tumor, what we typically do is we kill a lot of the cells, but by bad luck, there's so many cells in there and there's so many mutations that some mutant cells are actually resistant to the drug. They don't, aren't killed by the drug. So we call cells that die from a drug sensitive cells and cells that don't die, so they're resistant cells. And because those cells are left behind and they no longer have many competitors uh, sort of taking up space and the resources, they tend to grow back really quickly and the patient relapses with the same cancer, except it's not the same cancer. It's a cancer that cells that have now uh, evolved from those mutant cells that are resistant to the drug. So you try to apply the same drug again and it won't work. So what we do typically is we try a different drug and it gets harder and harder. In fact, this is sort of what happens when we're spiraling the drain in the oncology clinic. You get a diagnosis and then if the, drug, if the cancer's metastatic that's spread to the body, then you have to use something like a systemic drug you give to the whole, you know, your whole system. I'm calling drug number one. You give it for a fixed protocol of dosing for some number of weeks. And then some months after that, you check to see if it worked. You go in for an MRI or a CAT scan or PET scan. And even if it worked, you don't know if you actually got all the cells. So it's often in a matter of months or years later, the cancer comes back and it's resistant to that drug. So you have to go to drug two you do a fixed protocol, how to give drug two. A few months later, you check if it worked. Even if it does work, often it comes back and then you go to drug three. And every time you go to these next drugs, 
it gets harder and harder to treat. It's less and less likely the drug will actually work. And even if it does work and shrinks the tumor, it typically comes back uh, faster and faster. Um, and soon, pretty soon we run out of drugs. But the cool thing is that farmers have faced the same kind of problem and they're actually 30 years ahead of oncologists. So farmers have this problem of spraying their fields with pesticides. And they noticed back in the 1910s that and some would be behind and they would grow back and start destroying the crops and that pesticide would no longer work. And it's for the same reason that we see this in cancer, the pesticide has selected for pests that are resistant. And so people, but people started using lots of pesticides and more and more to try to control the pests um, until in the 70s, people started getting very concerned with the kind of environmental damage from the pesticides. And this is actually equivalent to what's happening in the oncology cl clinic. We're also very concerned about the kind of damage we do to the healthy cells in your body, the toxicity of our drugs. So there became pressure to try to reduce pesticides. Um, so people tried, well, what if you combine two pesticides, maybe you can give them at lower dose and maybe the pests would be less likely to be resistant to both pesticides. But what they saw in the eighties was that that also doesn't work. It just selects for pests that are resistant to both pesticides. And that's essentially where we are in oncology today. We're giving multiple drugs usually, and we still uh, don't often cure these metastatic cancers. It comes back as resistant to all the multiple drugs. But the farmers went on and they've developed a technique called integrated pest management, which is actually a combination of a bunch of strategies. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that. And this is how, how farmers are becoming resilient to the challenge of pests. And we wanna learn from them how to be resilient to cancer, how to treat cancer. So integrated pest management is a cycle where they identify what kind of pests they have in their field and understand about its life cycle and the predators and pathogens. They engage in uh, ways to try to prevent the pests from getting into the fields um, or, or uh, thriving in the fields. They can change how you're watering the crops or when you're planting. Um, they observe very carefully what's going on in the crops and they also set out traps so they can observe uh, what pests are, what's happening with the pests. Are they becoming more numerous? Are they changing in some ways? And then they have more direct interventions, mechanical controls like taking them out, biological controls like adding pathogens or the predators of the pest and chemical controls and that's the pesticides or for us the uh, chemotherapies. And they give these and then they evaluate and they evaluate actually on an almost a daily basis. They're checking their traps and seeing what's going on. And they, they go through this cycle, they check how they're doing, how it has changed and they adjust what they're doing. So the pests, the principles of pest management uh, that they've come to over the last 30 years are things like, well, they assume resistance is present. So they know they can't get a cure. They can't eradicate the pests. And that's something we don't typically assume in the oncology clinic. Although the observation is that generally resistant cells generally are present even before the patient has been treated. They also won't treat a field if the damage is tolerable. So they just hold off until the damage becomes intolerable. And if it is intolerable, they use the minimum effective dose. And this is a big contrast to what we do in the oncology clinic. In the oncology clinic, we use the maximum tolerable dose. We try to get the biggest dose of, of chemotherapy um, because the more drug you can give, the more cells you can kill. And we're hoping for a for a cure. Now the farmers also try to diversify the types of drugs they're giving so that if a pest is resistant to one type of drug, it's unlikely to be resistant to the other type. And we try to do that somewhat in the oncology clinic. They also, they never use the same drug twice in a row because every time you spray a field with a pesticide, you're selecting for those resistant pests. So the more you do it, the more resistant pests you'll get. Now in the oncology clinic, unfortunately, we use the same drug over and over, week after week, until the tumor starts growing again, until we have basically failed. So that's a big difference. Um, they, as I mentioned, they combine these chemical controls with other kinds of controls and mechanical, biological, and cultural, and they monitor continuously and adapt. But the other really interesting thing they noticed is that there's a cost to this resistance. So there's no free lunch here. A pest that's resistant to a pesticide isn't as good at reproducing and surviving in the absence of the drug. So sensitive pests can actually outcompete resistant pests in the absence of drug. Or for us, Bob Gatenby, who, who saw this, wondered, well, can sensitive cancer cells actually outcompete resistant cancer cells? That's really important because 
in the Western world, if you're treated for cancer, what kills you is not sensitive cancer cells, it's the resistant cancer cells. So they're the real problem. So the way I think about this is that oncologists can control sensitive cells with our chemotherapies and sensitive cells can actually control resistant cells through competition. But what we typically do in the oncology clinic is we go in with this maximum tolerated dose, we kill all the sensitive cells, resistant cells have no competitors left and they just blow up and kill the patient. So what Bob Gatenby suggested is let's and this strategy is called adaptive therapy. And the, the basic insight here is to keep sensitive cells alive. And, that, and that's the idea that the enemy of your enemy is your friend. So the enemy of the resistant cells is the sensitive cells and they're actually our friends and can we use them? So he did some uh, mouse experiments where they treated mice with cancer. Some, uh, they gave them different kinds of human cancers, ovarian cancer, a really aggressive form of breast cancer called triple negative, and also a more common form of breast cancer called ER positive, estrogen, estrogen receptor positive. And these lower lines with the little arrows here, that's the size of the tumor over time as they're treating with adaptive therapy. And these other lines are the size of the tumor when they're treating with standard therapy. So they were actually able to keep control of these tumors indefinitely. And eventually the mice died of, of old age. So the first human trial has been done with this strategy. Uh, it was in, done in metastatic prostate cancer that was already uh, resistant to normal hormone therapy. So they're using the second line therapy, which is called abiraterone. And they use the strategy where if the PSA level, which is a measurement of how much tumors in the man, that PSA level fell below 50% of its original value, then they would stop dosing with abiraterone. And if it ever came back to 100% of its original value, they'd start dosing again. It was a small trial. There were 11 patients. They're sort of graphed here. And what you see in red is the time that this patient was on therapy, and black is the time that they're off therapy. And what you can see right away is that different men have different dynamics. Some of the tumors shrink fast and grow fast. Some of them shrink slowly and grow back slowly. Um, and this is a comparison group. The standard of care is just to give the, the, the abiraterone drug continuously until the patient progresses. That's what the little X means. And so when this paper was published back in 2017, only one of the patients on adaptive therapy had progressed. They hadn't even hit their median progression, time to progression, um, but it was already a very statistically significant difference between the uh, adaptive therapy and the standard of care. So eventually uh, enough of the patients progressed on therapy that they found that they had a 30 month median time to progression. So it took for half of these patients, it, it took more than 30 months um, before their Two tumors minutes. started growing. Thanks. Um, and that's in comparison to just giving the drug in the standard way if we, in which it takes only about 16 or uh, 14 months, depending on the, the study. And the other interesting thing about this is these patients had less drug than these patients. So the patients in the adaptive therapy arm, uh, they only used 40% on average of the drug that the patients on the continuous arm used. So not only does this strategy seem to uh, extend life, but also reduces the amount of drug you're taking, reduces the toxicity. And we think, uh, of course, will increase the quality of life. And that's something that we're, we wanna study and, and verify. So this whole approach we've learning from farmers is to try to change cancer from an acute disease that kills us to a chronic disease that we can control and just live with, live out the rest of our lives with and not die from. So we're, we wanna, we're excited to take this idea from farmers and also try the other ideas from integrated pest management. And the other really exciting thing for me about this is that it doesn't matter what drug we're using. We don't have to invent a whole new drug and go through that 20 year process of, of validating it. We can use all the drugs that are on the shelf. This can be applied to any type of cancer. We just have to do the clinical trial to show that it's better than the standard of care. So with that, I will stop. That's excellent, Carlo. It's given me actually all sorts of new ideas. So it'll be interesting when we all get to the point where we can talk together. Um, so next up is um, curator Jenny Lamb. So um, you're on. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Jenny Lamb. Thank you. This is a little bit about me. For the purpose of tonight's talk, I'm going to be focusing more on my curatorial work and how I build community through that. Um, Artists on the Lamb is a play on my name, so that kind of sets the tone for my entire curatorial venture. Not taking art too seriously and uh, always employing a bit of playfulness and irreverence. 
As an independent art curator, I'm not affiliated with any particular art gallery. So I'm able to put on art shows all over Chicago in wildly different venues from traditional galleries to uh, the more unconventional. For instance, I've curated a show in a massive former bank building. And before that, there was a vaudeville theater. And I curate art across all mediums, um, from painting to sculpture to performance and everything in between. And most importantly, all living artists. Um, a lot of artists are local to Chicago, uh, and I have artists from all over the world as well. Each show has a different concept, but my overarching concept is interaction. Interactive art, audience participation, collaboration, community. For these shows, I like to use open calls. So I cast a wide net either online or even through word of mouth. And it really expands my reach and through them because the art world can be so insular. Um, open calls are a way to discover artists such as emerging artists who later tell me that I gave them their first real show um, and in general, people who are underrepresented in the art world, and now they get a platform, because as a curator, you're a person who provides people with these platforms. Um, and through my open calls, my shows are able to be diverse, not only in terms of race and ethnicity, but also age, experience, background, and more. So the first show I ever created independently in 2011 was Exquisite Corpse. Um, based on the old salon game of the Exquisite Corpse. So I put out an open call, selected artists, and I arranged the artists into groups and pairs. Most of these artists didn't know one another beforehand, and I gave them one month to collaborate on creating new art for the show together. Also in 2011, um, my blog, which had a lot of discussion posts, I posed oftentimes quite loaded questions and let folks discuss in the comments of the blog. And they were true debates and discussions. Those discussions were the basis and foundation of the community I started to build. People felt heard and like they were actually participating and they kept coming back because they're a part of something. One of those discussions that you can see here from 2011 might have looked like kind of a pot stirring question on my part with everything from the wording to the tags I use. But it was actually my lead up to, I can do that in 2012. I created this show based on how a lot of people go up to contemporary art and say, well, I can do that, or my kid could do that. So at this show, I had the artist's original art supplies in front of each piece, as well as blank canvases and other surfaces, and challenged people to see if they could indeed do that or if they felt like they could improve the artwork, um, they could directly mark the actual work itself. And it was a lot of fun. And it was eventually named the best art exhibit in uh, New Cities, that's a Chicago issue. So my mission is always to make art accessible. Most people might feel intimidated going into a contemporary art gallery. And I try to do away with that because art is for everyone. Engagement is something that also is vital for community building. So many art receptions I've been to, barely anyone so much as looks at the art, but at I Can Do That, people were directly involved with its creation. And a lot of people stayed for hours, which rarely happens, spending time with each piece and with each other, having spontaneous encounters with other people. Community is formed when you bring in people from all walks of life across generations. And it exemplified my objective of bringing people together, getting people to have fun with art, getting people to have fun with each other, and maybe also seeing the world anew and learning a thing or two. A new way of thinking is possible and a better world is possible. You just have to have an imagination. Um, I love this photo. Community is also formed when you get rid of barriers. And one of these obstacles in the art world is often art speak, or just art jargon. I did this with Lexicon in 2016. It was a massive international show where I didn't display any art statements next to the pieces. Instead, I had viewers write down on post-it notes what they thought each artwork meant to them or what they thought each artwork meant. Um, and I had them display their own interpretations directly next to each artwork. So this is a lot more interaction. 
Fast forward to 2020, probably the year of resilience, um, slation. So I'm Chinese American, my parents are immigrants from Hong Kong, and I've always been proud of my heritage. Yet even though I've always had wonderfully diverse art shows, I never explicitly curated a show based on uh, celebrating my heritage or based on identity. So I decided to do just that. Creating a show of the, the art, Asian artists of Chicago and the greater Midwest area. And like always, I put out an open call. And in this open call, I specified that you didn't have to make art about identity. You didn't have to make art about being Asian. You're valid if you make art in general. One of the artists in the show is driven by a concept called narrative plentitude, which means that there is an abundance of stories so that no single story has to stand out to represent an entire group as a monolith. And that can be implied, applied to the entire show. There are so many artists, each with different dreams, desires, and beliefs, because that's who we are as complex beings. The show was slated to open on March 20th, 2020. The weeks leading up to that were quite something. <laughs> um, with the pandemic becoming a reality that month, uh, one week before the show was slated to open, I postponed it indefinitely and moved the entire exhibition online. Resilience is being able to adapt quickly. Of course, the show also took on a different importance. With the beginning of COVID came scapegoating and xenophobia and just in general, anti-Asian racism. Now the onus shouldn't be on marginalized people to teach others that we're actually human beings. But that said, art can be used as a means for compassion and connection. Art cultivates empathy. And at the very least, I figured this show could provide comfort either to everyone in, univer in a universal way um, or within this community. It's a way to tell our own stories, to take control of the narrative because no one else is going to tell your own story. So you might as well tell it. And there's a silver lining to putting a show online. One of my features was having digital exclusives, art that wasn't going to be in the physical show simply because there wasn't enough space. But online, there's endless wall space. It's infinite. And it goes full circle to my mission of making art accessible. The internet is the most accessible space for artwork, more than any gallery. I actually had people tell me from other countries that they were happy that I moved the show online because they were they wanted to be able to see the show, but they wouldn't have done that if they had to travel. Um, and also the show is ongoing. It's been almost a year and it's still up, whereas physical exhibitions are mostly only a couple weeks long. And those positives got me to my idea for Decahedron. Two minutes. Th thank you. This June, Artists on the Land is celebrating its 10th anniversary. I wanted to make it as big of an online celebration as possible, centering around a big online exhibition. So recently, I went and personally invited every single artist who's ever been in one of my shows from the past 10 years, as well as artists that I admire, but who haven't been in my shows yet, um, but who I really want to exhibit. Which brings it back to the building of community. It's been 10 years of building lasting, sustainable relationships with artists. Genuine relationships where artists are supported, not with the intention of saying, oh, well, maybe I'll have them in my show one day, but an earnest desire to help fellow artists and help your own community. As of now in the early stages, I have 50 something artists who have said yes to being in this show so far. That's not something I would have attempted for a physical show. So I've gone full circle. Artists at Malam started as a blog and now the 10th anniversary show is going to be exclusively online. And that's something to look forward to. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Jenny. Really, really good work. Um, it's lovely to hear you present that work because it's given me another way to think about this this uh, topic. Um, so let's move on to Chris. Um, Chris, I want, I got to uh, curate your uh, Question Bridge, which is a stellar media piece. I guess we decided over five years ago. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you to describe the rest of your work. And I hope you'll talk about that piece as well. I will. So um, 
first of all, I want to thank Pam for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, I mean, I always know that when Pam calls, something unusual is going to happen. But what I loved about this was that it gave me a chance to think about the notion of um, resilience um, and what it meant to me. And I realized my first impression was that um, there's something about words like resilience and tolerance that I'm slightly uncomfortable with. Um, and it's because we usually define resilience and tolerance in terms of things that are negative that we have to push against um, or survive. Um, and you know, this is not to, to say that, that that quality of um, developing fortitude isn't important against adversity. Um, I have two really good examples of, of that in my own life. Um, I have a sister who recently died um, after suffering um, years with lung cancer. Um, I have another friend who um, is somehow managing to stay himself suffering from a disease that inflames his legs. I mean, he's utterly transformed um, because of the, the pain. And I, every time I call Frank, you know, I, I, I say, you know, how is it that you're still able to be the person that I knew despite this? So, and then of course, you know, what's, what's going on in Texas is a good example of people who, you know, have to have a quality of real resistance in order to survive and maintain their lifestyle. So, so I'm not trying to say that the way we understand resilience and adaptation and um, tolerance isn't important, but especially as a creative artist, um, there's another way to think about the forces that are involved with pushing through adversity, um, sometimes really great challenges, um, for purpose, for the reason that you are not pushing against something, you're actually being drawn forward into the adversity um, by a force that feels positive, um, that feels creative. Um, it feels like a life force. It feels like it's something bigger than yourself, um, that, that makes telling your story a necessity. So, so you're confronted with um, a compelling motivational necessity that pulls you forward and keeps you confronting challenges. Um, and you know that can look like resilience from the outside, but from the inside, it feels like something very different. Um, so what I wanna do is show you a couple of examples of my work where I think this positive form of motivational um, resilience, if you will, I think um, becomes very real. So it became very real for me. Um, so I wanted to show a piece of work that I don't think you're familiar with, Pam. <laughs> I know she's very familiar with Question Bridge and I will show a little bit about that. Um, but first I'm gonna share my screen. I'm excited about that, Chris. <laughs> oh, good. So, Art and resilience. So what I want to do is talk to you about a piece of work um, that looks like this. So what makes this a challenging thing to have done has to do with the, um, the themes and the experiences that were behind it, um, behind the making of it, um, which involve a lot of um, shame, frankly, and a lot of embarrassment um, and a lot of personal pain. Um, so that there were many people in my life um, who knew me, they thought very well, who knew nothing about this. But um, the experience that uh, motivated it was um, a child abuse incident that happened between myself and my mother. Um, and, you know, I was well into my 30s or maybe 40s, you know, before um, something happened that created that positive force that I was talking about. And it had to do with my mother um, getting um, pancreatic cancer um, and dying. And I'm going to show you the first panel of this piece, um, where you see, you know, a flame in the center, and that flame is a recreation of an experiment that I did when I was five years old, because um, I was very curious about fire, and, and especially with um, book matches, I mean, with um, uh, wood matches, and you know, there was a flame and a little bead of water that seemed to, to come off of the stick. And I was curious about that. I wondered, gee, can you prevent one match from lighting if the water prevents it? So I, I was doing this five-year-old experiment in the oven of my of my home in the, in the uh, housing projects where we lived. And I thought I was um, having a good old time. And I 
crumbled up the aluminum foil and threw it away. And uh, and then, of course, my mother came home and uh, discovered that I'd been playing with fire. And she said, I'm going to punish you in a way that you'll never forget. And that's what precipitated the um, the incident between she and I that I, I reenacted. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit more about this. I mean, what I what I did is I to create a kind of setting around um, the recreation of the fire experiment um, that caused the punishment. You see a family album with people um, printed to reproduce to the size of their sort of importance in my life. So you see my mother looming very large to the right and my father, a smaller influence. Um, and it's kind of a long story, I don't have time to tell you, but the, the woman on the left is my great grandmother who was herself a, um, an abuser of my grandmother who's on the right. Um, so there's this cycle of child abuse um, in the form of punishment in my family. Um, but um, the second panel, you can see what I did was I reenacted um, what my mother did to me. Um, so you see a, a light painting. That's why I'm partially there and not partially there. But I, you know, she tied me hand and foot and beat me with a belt. Um, and you know, I always felt um, deeply responsible for for that. Like it was my fault, of course. And uh, so I just I recreated this in a lighting studio. Um, it was important for me to go back to the experience. But I want to get to the third panel, and, and you're not going to be able to see this clearly, um, but. On the right, there, oh, maybe you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Oh, cool. <laughs> Thanks, <Yeah>. Carlo. <laughs> um, so what, what it's saying here is give me back my hand and foot. Um, so I gave my mother a journal while she was in the hospice and she wrote these passages that I Xerox copied and created this collage. Um, she had a stroke which disabled her hand and feet. And when I read the words, um, give me back my hand and feet, I realized that she and I shared this legacy of bondage in a way, you know, because here I am tied up hand and foot. So I realized that that it's time for me to deal with this issue, um, which is what motivated me to recreate it. Um, so I'm trying to give a, a rendition of um, the, the force that kept me doing this, that took me back to that couch um, that, that caused me to relive it. Um, the grid that I you know, created over my face um, was a way to try to talk about or illustrate or create a visual analogy for the, um, the prior restraint that happens on your character when you are um, too motivated by being a good person um, for fear of punishment. Two um, minutes. Thank you. So that's, so that's what that piece is about. And, and that's the positive force that led me into creating this work. Um, which I feel very grateful for. Um, and here's two minutes of Question Bridge, just to give you a sense, and I'll show you just a little bit of it. So you know what I'm talking about. It's a project that that's, it took me four years working with a team, um, traveling around the country, visiting black men all over. Um, Black man, do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance for taking responsibility for improving our communities? Are your children better or worse off as a result of your involvement? Why wouldn't you be happy with this? I mean, yeah. Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is why. So you see, all we did was get men to ask questions of other black men. I believe that we've incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker. Along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. I'm, I'm gonna stop it there just because I wanna give us time to talk. Um, but I wanna say that the, the, the motivation to spend four years doing that project came from not only the fact that I could tell that it was very healing for the black men um, to be able to ask those questions, um, but also being confronted with a videotaped question of another black man. The men were incredibly open about answering the questions. So we ended up with this three hour um, document 
I mean, the, actually the whole project was 15 hours when you edit out all the questions and answers, but the piece that became the installation is a three hour piece. And that's what Pam has seen and, and curated into the Exploratorium. And it's, it's been all over the country, um, all over many places in the world, it's in the Smithsonian now. Um, but, but, but the positive motivation that made us continue working for years is how much we were learning um, about our own lives as black men. Um, so that's, so again, from the outside, that maybe looks like resilience, but from the inside, it feels like um, you're part of something much bigger than yourself that makes all of the um, fortitude or whatever ingenuity that it takes to keep going very much worth it. You do beautiful work, Chris. You always have. Um, so let's open it up. Um, let's talk about resilience. I think we've already started to see that resilience is a really complicated term. Um, what do people have to say about that? And, and um, if you are joining us in the chat, feel free to uh, ask questions and I'll try to field them and make sure that people, it's part of our uh, conversation. I mean, one of the things, go ahead. I was just gonna say, one of the things that I thought was interesting about Carlos's um, presentation was he used words like identify, prevent, observation and intervention. And I started thinking about that that could be ways that we could actually start treating each other differently in, and actually trying to listen a little better and observe a little better. Um, so that was just one of the things that kind of came up when I was listening to his um, talk. Carlo, are you gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, Chris, the, the point you were just made at the end about um, the feeling that it was something larger than ourselves or that yourselves and that was an important um, motivator and I think also supporter for us. And I think that's true for many of us turn to transcendent communities uh, to be, you know, to find meaning and resilience and support and things that are feel larger than ourselves. I think that's really important in humans. Yeah, I mean, I discovered that, you know, interesting things happen when you investigate where human beings or entities get, get the a motivation and capability to continue. When you, when you interrogate that question, you discover qualities that are sometimes universal and really important. Diana just asked, she just put a little thing that says resilience equals fortitude plus ingenuity. Uh, and I think that's true. But as I was listening to you, Chris, I was actually thinking about the word resilience as maybe akin a little bit to acceptance. You know, um, and that's kind of what I was getting a little bit from the way that you are articulating and your response to the word. Because um, it can be a, a not necessarily a good thing is what I'm thinking. And I hadn't considered that before. Yeah, like I said, I, I think that um, there's a kinship between resilience and the word tolerate, you know? I mean, it's really funny how in the social, in the realm of social justice, we we think of tolerance as being a very positive thing. But I don't think most people would, would um, choose to be tolerated. <laughs> Framed that way, um, you are a negative thing that the person you know, is um, able to um, stay in touch with, you know, but, but against their will almost. Um, so so that, that's why I try to understand, like what is it that that positively motivates people to, to deal with challenging things um, because you grow, because, because it's worth it, um, because it makes your life and maybe the lives of people involved um, better. I, I think that's, that's a, a more um, forward thinking way of approaching the issue of resilience. And, and Jenny, I feel like the work that you're doing you're giving people agency and control in a way, in a, in, a, in a format and in a discipline that people don't necessarily feel that they have that kind of agency and control. It's usually the art is put upon them, sometimes from on high. Um, so I feel like you're addressing it in a very unique way, um, this idea of community and bringing people in so that they have that agency. Thank you, yes, um, exactly. I feel like I probably have that perspective because I'm an artist myself. And I'm an artist. I feel like I'm an artist first and foremost. I've been drawing since I was a baby, <laughs> pretty much. And so I, my love of art stemmed from being an artist. And then curating came 
afterwards. Um, so yeah, like being in the shoes of an artist, I feel like I have more of a unique understanding, um, not to knock other curators or other gallerists, but a better understanding of where an artist is coming from and how a lot of times artists feel powerless, like in the, in the structure of the art world, the artist, even though we think of the artist as being the star, a lot of times the artist is at the very bottom and I don't want people to feel that way at all as an artist. It's definitely I, something. I curated a, uh, um, a fashion show probably about four or five years ago. And, um, and there was a curated runway and there was the non-curated runway. And the non-curated runway was just heaps more interesting. And I was, it was like this moment where I think people, I was witnessing people's rejection of being curated, I think, because I did, I did have this other opportunity and, and people were just like, well, I don't need to be, I don't need to be curated. I don't need to have to go through this bottleneck of approval. I'm going to go over here. Um, and I, and I, I thought it was always about that, you know, very interesting. Did we lose Carlo, I guess, huh? I don't know. He seems to have. Yeah, he froze for a while and then dropped. Then he dropped out. Well, we were just talking about how technology can be such a, a problem. Um, so Diana says Chris spoke of question bridge as healing. I wonder if each of the panelists can speak to their creative practice and healing in a time when we need so much healing. Excellent thought. What What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, I guess I hope I made clear that. that um, I mean, like probably the best way that the, um, the self-portrait project um, really functioned as a healing process for me was the way I understood it, um, other than in terms of my own experience, was when it was exhibited in a, a show in Pittsburgh. And while I was at one end of the gallery, I, I noticed this African-American woman, a middle-aged woman, um, staring at it. And I, I wondered what was going on in her mind. And she called across the gallery eventually, have you forgiven her for this yet? <laughs> a total stranger. Wow. And, and I realized that she, she understood that, um, that there was um, a form of sublimated forgiveness, you know, um, implied by my putting this out there. And if you, if you see the text that I extracted and put a, in a cloud around my face, from her journal, you can see that she was, uh, I'm, I'm, it's kind of a narrative about how much she loved us. And so I do understand ultimately that, you know, what, what I consider always to be a kind of violation and tragedy was actually an act of love on her part, just over an overreaction. Um, and, but I, I couldn't have gotten to that place of understanding that, I think, if I hadn't been motivated to go into that creative process and reenact that. Um, action. And I'm very glad that I did. How about you, Jen? Jenny? Shouldn't tell you, Jen. <laughs> but, like, when you were talking about healing, I was also thinking about catharsis and how cathartic art can be. I mean, when you were, Chris, when you were talking about your art, I was definitely, like, catharsis was the main word that was going through my mind um, and how art can be used as that, as that channel. Um, yeah, that was, it was beautiful. Yeah, I just got a message from Carlo. His internet dropped, but he he'll come when he can. Okay. I was really worried about my internet because usually I'm the one. <laughs> so I'm really glad I didn't. Yeah. We're all we're all at the uh, at the beck and call of internets. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to be resilient about that, you know, <laughs> um, and not get too stressed out about it. Um, so. Just from, you know, it's interesting that we're, we're at this moment in time where, I mean, I am getting new thoughts about the word resilience in terms of this idea that it is not necessarily, it, it could be seen as not a powerful tool, a tool of power. Um, and I just wonder if you guys had any thoughts about that. Hi, Carlo, nice to see you again. <laughs> Happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should say that I work for Carlo and we have a full blown um, artists and science um, residency program where we are doing artworks based um, around the topic of cancer and it's been unexpectedly interesting. So I should say that. 
Um, but anyway, so what do, what do we what do we think about resilience at the moment? Are you asking? I, I'm kind of asking you guys because I'm not seeing as many. I mean, we have a very small group today, so <clears throat> I guess I guess I'm asking because I was thinking of resilience as a completely 100% positive thing. You know, like it's a mm -hmm. it's a word of power, um, and I realize that's it's more complicated than that. Um, but there is the issue of uh, tolerating stuff that shouldn't be tolerated, right? right? Being resilient to a bad situation rather than changing it. Right, right. Um, and then you know, yeah, there's that ahead, old Chris. expression, you know, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So that's, that's again. Yeah. Sometimes it just cripples you. Yeah, that's a graphic way to illustrate the negative force, you know, that results in resilience. Yeah, because it, it could it could be like a a, a Nazi um, tank. It just goes right over you, right? I mean, it's uh, you can be resilient and you can and you can die. Um, yeah. In the, in the chat, Dan is asking about what what we should think. What twenty twenty one will be if twenty twenty was the year of resilience? Uh, what do you think, guys? <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead. yeah, I definitely agree with. Well, now, because I think resilience is a word that is that has been overused, um, I definitely always thought of it as a positive term as well. But I mean, I'm on I'm on Twitter and uh, multiple people who aren't connected to one another had similar. They said similar things like, I don't want to be resilient or if I hear the word resilient one more time. And on the inside, I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> I'm going to be on a panel about this word resilience. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I think people are kind of getting fatigued of being resilient and people want to see results. People want to see, people want to be, um, have agency. There's also about. the issue of, or a possibility of some, some systems you want to be brittle. You want them to break to let you know something's going on. The, the canary in the coal mine, mm. right? You don't always want resilience. Sometimes you want sensitivity. Thinking, thinking again about you know, like like what is it that um, makes that justifies persistence and re resilience? Um, I think about that that uh, famous quote by Theodore Parker that um, Martin Luther King Jr. made famous: um, "The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice." Um, you know, I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> And I think that, that the reason why that is true um, is because a lot of us have survived, you know? And uh, I think of this year as being, I mean, the way things are evolving so far, you know, after the trauma of 2000, you know, 2020, um, we're here, we've survived, I mean, our Republic has survived and, and there's a reason to believe that, um, you know, that there's a positive future. So um, you've got to keep, keep the faith. I feel like the year of 2020 is going to be the year of trying to learn how to be social again and sort of flex a lot of rusty muscles and yeah, mm -hmm. re, how to re-emerge into the world. Um, uh, so Robert Langham has a question in the Q&A. It says, in pursuit of art, my experience is failing along the path from disaster to disaster until something emerges, emerges. Resilience to, or at least ignoring failure is a necessary part of the process. Ha, like that. Yeah, I like that. I agree with it. Well, it's, it's, like, te it's like both science and art, you know, you, you find yourself in this constant, um, you're always pushing the boulder up the hill because you're doing something really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess Sisyphus <laughs> really is the, the classic symbol of resilience, isn't it? You know, um, and Camus, who wrote a book called *The Myth of Sisyphus*, you know, tried to make the point that uh, um, that he wasn't just doing it to be a uh, masochistic. You know, he was he was motivated um, to to so strongly that the process of going up and coming back was his life's mission. Um, I think we're all in that in that space because you know we know where it's going to end. <laughs> I mean, all of us know, 
I mean, I'm sitting here in Oakland, California, and I know that there's going to be an earthquake maybe before I finish this sentence, you know, but, but you have reasons to keep going, you know. I, I like Diana's uh, suggestion that re-emergence is a, is a theme for 2021, in part because I'm also worried about new variants of the virus re-emerging. Uh, so this, not just us, uh, but, but possibly uh, some bad stuff as well. Yeah. And I, th I think resilience actually also uh, has to do with time because I feel like, you know, a year ago, it wasn't really about resilience. It was about something else. And I think it's because we're ground down by these occurrences, by people being pushed on the street, you know, and have to fall down and they're elderly or, or, or by, you know, uh, having to demonstrate on something that is just human common sense and decency. Um, and to be figure out a way to deal with that and not just go completely out of your mind, I think that's part of the resilient part. And, and how do we do that over time? Because we're the, the next year, we all hoped that 2021 would be like, oh, thank God, you know, we don't have to be resilient anymore. <laughs> we can just move on with our lives. And then we had January 6th happen, which was like definitely a spear in people's hearts. Um, and it, but it is that kind of time thing too, I think is part of the, the, the thought about resilience. It's not just about resi being resilient in a second, you know? That's right. And you, and you learn so much about yourself when you have to recover from failure. Um, you really yeah. do. Yeah, I, I've always wanted to tell my children that, um, you know, dealing with success is easy, right? Dealing with failure is the thing that really distinguishes the people who, who end up succeeding, the champions, right? They, they can learn from their failures, they can bounce back with, they can sustain them and practice harder or whatever it is. Yeah, and I, I feel like all, all of us here um, and probably a good amount of people in other disciplines are, are facing those kinds of failures for a variety of reasons. I always think about performers right now. I'm, I'm just so heartbroken for performers. Um, you know, they can't do their work. They, uh, they, it's, it's very hard for them. I do see a lot of very intriguing uh, workarounds. And Jenny, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned um, how different it is to be online. There's certain benefits to that. Um, I, I would like to do a, um, a show on uh, disability because I've been um, talking to some, some um, disabled artists and they've been talking about how for the first time they're at the table, they're even and even maybe a little ahead because they're really comfortable with this technology. Um, and I think that that's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, in that regard, what Jenny is doing is really heroic. You're providing venues for people who otherwise be, be ignored. Um, so good for you. It's great. Thank you. You've been doing it for 10 years. Incredible. Talk about results. Yeah, time, time flies. I really, I cannot believe it's been, sometimes I feel like I'm burning out. Yeah. I like the fact that you were talking about humor and joy as well. Um, and there must be something somewhat transgressive about allowing people to um, work on other people's work. You know, that opportunity, that, that's, that's pretty radical. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, about that, what that was like? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it all just came about with me thinking about problems that aren't really problems. I mean, just, just minor annoyances of, of hearing people you know, say I, I can do that painting. Or, and I just want to be like, don't you know art history? <laughs> and you just want to shake them. But also, I mean, it's something that we've all admittedly thought at one point or another. I know I've thought it at some point. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's a way to, to laugh at ourselves a little bit, but also, I mean, humor brings people together. There's a little bit of irreverence, but also at the core of it, there's an earnestness. I mean, the earnestness of just, I'm going to create a painting with this stranger. I'm going to create a painting with my friends and then we're going to have this encounter. Um, yeah, I mean, it was wild and it was messy um, and it was a lot of fun. And I can't believe it's been so long since that show right now. 
Did, yeah. did, did you have any artists that were upset? I mean, what, what were the original paintings? Were, were any of them alive? <laughs> I, it, well, it wasn't, it wasn't something I sprung on them as a surprise. It, like it was in the open call that like, this is the premise of the show. Submit artwork that you're okay with having people alter or having people make copies of. Um, so everyone was, everyone was up for it. Um, I, if anyone was upset, they didn't tell me. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I mean, there were 40 something artists. I'm sure at least one person um, was bummed with like <laughs> with the result. Um, but I mean, they didn't express it, which might've been a good thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I could go on thinking it was a victorious effort. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was overall a positive experience and for artists, it was also a way for them to think about their own artwork in a different way because they had complete uh, a complete outside perspective, um, either changing their art or interpreting it. And it was kind of a way for them to step outside of their own comfort zones and take a risk. And I was really proud of those artists for doing that. Did, did you find that the artists who were contributing were making things that would be hard to copy or easy to copy? As it's funny because as going back to just talking about curating, I selected artwork that was going to be easier to copy. <laughs> so, so this was also me curating in the traditional sense of selecting pieces that people were submitting. I didn't want something that was so complex that it felt like I was being mean-spirited um, as a challenge. It's like, ha, you can't copy this. So I, I picked artwork that it wasn't too easy, but also just stand like artwork that I enjoyed, but also I felt like it was going to, it was going to allow the most interaction. That makes sense. Um, you know, I'd be curious to learn more about this um, collaboration between cancer and art. Like oh. those are two yeah. ideas you don't normally think of going together. So sure. I'd, I'd be curious to know, like what are some of the more, more unexpected and productive and creative outcomes of this process sure. of bringing those two things together. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, the one that's easiest for me to talk about is actually one with music. And I was you know, working with Pam, I was thinking about how can we describe this evolutionary dynamic, this churning of cells and mutations, that cells are dying and being born and they're expanding and they're being attacked by the immune system. It's a very dynamic um, system and, and I was sort of struggling with how to illustrate it, you know, with a with a painting or a drawing or you know photograph. Um, it doesn't really lend those media don't really lend themselves to, to describing those dynamics that are important to understanding the disease. But then I realized that music has this nice analogy um, that it does change through time. It's dynamic, right? And so we I had this idea that if you have a multi-part like a symphony, for example, and say there's 20 different instruments playing at the same time, then I drew an analogy between a, a cell lineage, a cell that's dividing and changing through time uh, is like one of those parts of the music and different parts of our body are all cooperating like those parts of the music, right? So the whole symphony is like a body. And then you can represent cancer as one of those piece, one of those parts that stops doing what it should do, stops developing through its normal theme, and starts just repeating itself. Cancer sort of divide out of control and they just make copies of themselves. Um, and so every so what I what we did is we upload a piece of music in a format called Music XML, and we'd simulate cancer in the music. So we'd randomly check select one of the parts and take four measures of that part and just start repeating that rather than letting that part progress. But every time that part repeats, it's like going the cell going through the cell cycle and dividing. So we create a new version of that four measures with mutations. And we can actually represent the different kinds of genetic mutations that happen in cancer, like a single DNA base changing, like a single note changing, or sometimes bits of the genome get actually flipped around and we call it an inversion. So we can just do that with a bit of the four measures, we can sort of randomly select a subset of those notes and just reverse their order. Um, and there's other things that happen in, in cancer cells. There's something called a translocation where a piece of one chromosome gets stuck to a piece of another chromosome that should, shouldn't be next to. 
And so we can take a bit of our cancer theme, our four measure theme, like the first two measures, and then grab two measures from some other random bit of the piece and graft it on. And then, so what you hear when you listen to this is you hear your familiar piece starting, and then after a little while, something a little bit sour is happening, and then that builds in this dissonance and a cacophony. It's first, it sounds more like sort of carnival music, like a little bit creaky and weird, and then it just gets crazy. Um, and then we can simulate uh, therapy on that, like killing off a bunch of these cancer uh, parts in the in the song, in the piece, and hearing maybe some survive because this resistance, so like <laughs> maybe the flutes are resistant, you know, and then you hear the flutes growing uh, back. Um, and we can also illustrate this whole adaptive therapy idea, which we do. Um, so we have a website, it's about ready to launch, where you can upload your own XML, music XML piece, give it cancer, listen to what therapy is like, listen to what adaptive therapy is like on that piece. Um, and wow. play um, we are out of time. Um, can I just, if anybody has one more thing they want to say before we, um, we, we stop, is there anything, any last momentary things? I see there are a couple of comments and questions that maybe we can. Yeah, we could do them quickly. Um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to, um, keep anybody late. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, Robert is asking about, he says, Miss Lamb at the end, was there any piece of art that worked? If someone wanted to integrate it into their life or did they kind of overcook? I realized the point of the exercise was not to produce finished art. Robert Langham. Um, well, my answer is that all of it worked, I think, in my opinion, um, that the point of that show wasn't to sell the artwork. Um, so, so that was a different type of show. It wasn't a show where I set out to uh, make art sales. Um, so in that sense, um, so, so again, it, well, I guess, yeah. So in my opinion, it worked. It worked in that um, I accomplished what I set out to accomplish. So that's how the that artwork, but it wasn't, it wasn't like, I'm going to hang this up in my house. It wasn't like that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you so much for, uh, for the panelists. It was an extraordinary conversation. I learned a lot. And I wanted to thank um, Leonardo Lasers um and Alyssa, who's been running this whole thing and uh tune in next month because i know we'll have another interesting program so be well and um uh, thanks for inviting me yeah, yeah thank you it's great and jenny wonderful to meet you really you yeah it's i fantastic. agree all right take care chris, of yourselves you, everybody what chris if you want to uh, collaborate on on cancer and art we'd, be, we'd love to work with you okay <laughs> same invitation to you jenny yeah it's a stellar group we've got. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, everyone.